From terrifying found footage flicks to surprisingly original slashers to new twists on the possession genre, 2023 has been a killer year for horror. Here are the movies you shouldn't miss. If you like your horror on the weird side, you just might like Cobweb. Nothing is as it seems, and director Samuel Bowden keeps you on your toes every step of the way. A young boy named Peter hears strange knocking inside his bedroom walls. His parents brush off his claims as tall tales, but it becomes evident they're trying to hide something. This is an old house. There's bound to be bumps in the night. What exactly that may be reveals itself in a twisty revelation that'll leave you gobsmacked. Amid the creepy happenings, the film vines together a bizarre family drama about abuse. Peter's parents are always a bit aloof, and their parenting style grates against the nerves. From its weighted emotional underpinnings to skin-crawling cinematography, Cobweb makes for a delightful, funhouse romp through the bowels of human nature. Bess Wohl's directorial debut is an impressive one. Baby Ruby examines postpartum depression and the necessity of support systems. Noemi Merlon plays an influencer and lifestyle blogger named Joe, who gives birth to a newborn named Ruby. Almost immediately, Joe begins to believe that her child is angry with her, a trait of postpartum psychosis. As the film progresses, she loses herself and any sense of reality. Merlon's performance is appropriately scatterbrained. As societal pressures crash down around her, Joe falls further and further away from the person she once was. Baby Ruby knots together psychological thriller with real-life horror in a way that feels grounded. Many might struggle to see the horror of it all, but it's there in plain sight. Joe's emotional untethering is horrifying to witness, and it reaches such a fever pitch it's suffocating. To overlook it simply because it doesn't scream horror in the traditional sense is to undersell its agonizing emotional qualities. Baby Ruby takes clear cues from Rosemary's Baby, but manages not to live in its shadow. Don't believe the audience reviews of Malum. A reimagining of 2014's Last Shift, the Anthony de Blasi-directed feature takes what the original did and tightens the screws. It's a far more volatile, relentless foray into madness, with its brutality being something you have to see to believe. Rookie cop Jessica Lauren follows in her father's footsteps. For her first shift, she signs up to take the last shift at a dilapidated police station where her father died and a cult killed themselves. Strange occurrences unravel, putting Jessica through the ringer both mentally and physically. De Blasi takes no prisoners with Malum. While it's far slicker than Last Shift, it has enough skin-sawing bloodletting to make even stalwart horror fans gasp. Written by Scream scribe Kevin Williamson, John Hyam's Sick takes all the worry, paranoia, and fear of the COVID pandemic and shapes it into a nicely packaged slasher. There's somebody in the house. Where's your phone? When Parker and her friend Miri go on an excursion to Parker's family's cabin, Parker's on-again, off-again beau DJ shows up unexpectedly after following a trail of breadcrumbs posted to Parker's Instagram. But things take a turn for the worse when a group of intruders descend upon them for reasons unknown. Sick barrels through its story, not messing around with frivolous exposition or needless character backstory. When the killers are revealed, the film further focuses on the early days of the pandemic, when the uncertainty around the virus caused many to act a fool. All of this gives it plenty of cultural relevance, which goes a long way when it comes to horror flicks. The killer doll of the year goes to Model 3 Generative Android, or Megan for short. Sorry, Chucky. You snooze, you lose. In the world of robotics, Gemma manufactures a toy far too complicated for even its creator to understand. Gemma works out the code to be self-taught, picking up social cues from real-life interactions with Gemma's niece, Katie. What begins as an innocent plaything designed to give kids companionship morphs into a murderous figurine hellbent on protecting Katie at all costs. The high-tech silicone doll goes on a rampage by eliminating everyone in Katie's path, including a school bully who certainly had it coming. You know what happens to bad boys that don't mind their manners? They grow up to be bad men. When Gemma reprimands Katie for spending too much time with her shiny new toy, Megan sets her sights on Gemma. It's a battle of strength and ingenuity, nearly costing Gemma her life. Megan reinvents the killer doll genre with a smartly wound script and a rad doll design. And who could forget Megan's cutting quips and iconic viral dance? All the pieces are in place for a sequel, and let's hope it leans farther into the zaniness that made it just the right amount of charming. 
How Scream didn't venture to New York City before now is beyond us, where co-directors Matt bettinelli olpin and Tyler Gillette restarted the franchise in 2022's Scream with a familiar baton-passing story, the duo ratcheted everything up a few notches with Scream 6. Jenna Ortega and Melissa Barrera return as Tara and Sam respectively, and they're still reeling from their emotional and physical trauma. Each deals with their pain in their own way, for better or worse. Jasmine Savoy Brown and Mason Browning also return as the Meeks Martin twins. With NYC as a vast concrete playground, Scream 6 uses every chance to deliver the goods when it comes to vertigo-inducing set pieces. The latter scene alone is a chef's kiss. What? Erica, you have to move right now! You have to move! No! And Ghostface doesn't mess around. They're far more violent and merciless than ever before. From the twisty opening scene to the surprising finale, Scream 6 demonstrates that the franchise is far from dead. A mix of sci-fi and horror, Landlocked tells the tale of a young man named Mason who returns to his childhood home before it's set to be demolished. There, he uncovers a vintage video camera and a set of VHS tapes and begins to wander back through the halls of his childhood. Director Paul Owens captures the sorrowful beauty of growing old, the ephemeral quality of time, and how we never relive our glory days no matter how hard we try. As Mason traipses through the property, he loses himself in memories. With each tape, he tumbles into pivotal moments from his youth as they replay like a projection machine around him. While it's short on actual scares, the real horror stems from the stark reality that we're all victims of our inevitable mortality. This isn't new conceptual territory by any means, but Owens finds a way to make it original and affecting. Filmmaker Brad Anderson reshapes the vampire mythos with a story uniquely his own. Blood, written by Will Honley, asks questions about morality, ethics, and addiction through the lens of one child's vampiric condition. When a young boy named Owen gets bitten by the family dog, which vanished in the woods only to return wounded much later, Nurse Jess learns that her son has a new thirst for blood. Want more? But it's far more than that. Blood has become a life-saving elixir that gives him energy and returns him to his usual happy self. As Owen craves more and more, things become complicated when Jess first steals bags of blood from the hospital and then later turns her attention to live specimens. Things naturally escalate, and the lengths Jess is willing to go are tested. Blood mangles the senses with plenty of blood sucking and its ability to tell a very raw human story of desperation in such an exaggerated way. In a year that saw Renfield and the last voyage of the Demeter, Blood stands out as something truly unique and captivating. In Mother May I, Emmett and his fiance Anya return to Emmett's childhood home in order to sell off the property. Unresolved trauma around his late mother leaves Emmett irreparably damaged, but Anya believes that he can be cured. In a bizarre turn of events, Anya begins acting like his dead mother as immersion therapy, forcing him to finally deal with and move on from the past. What begins as drug-induced play acting turns into something far more terrifying and emotionally grueling. Anya puts him through the proverbial ringer, continuing the charade for the next several days. The lines between reality and fantasy blur, and Emmett must somehow confront the truth and find a way of pulling Anya back from the ledge. While writer-director Lawrence Vanicelli no doubt deserves praise for his execution, the spotlight is fully on Kyle Gallner and Holland Roden, both of whom absolutely dazzle in their roles, playing off one another to deliver two of the year's most psychologically disturbed performances. Talk To Me utilizes the theme of grief to tell a supernatural story about an embalmed hand. When you grab the hand and say, talk to me, you open up a portal to the other side by which you can communicate with the dead. The catch is that you have to sever the connection before 90 seconds pass or else. What happens after 90 seconds? <laughs> Don't want to stay. When Mia plays the game, it gives her a rush she has never known in life, so much so she becomes addicted to it pretty much instantaneously. The following night, tragedy strikes when Mia convinces her best friend Jade's little brother Riley to participate, setting off a bizarre and brutal turn of events. Talk to Me is relentless, brooding, and sharply written, a perfect example of why A24 has become the ultimate purveyor of modern horror classics. Mix a cult with sex work, and you have Candyland, 
Instead of exploiting sex workers for the sake of sensationalism, Swab's take is one of empathy and matter-of-fact presentation. Remy is newly emancipated from her cult family, deciding that such a strict, misguided lifestyle no longer suits her. She dreams of something different, even sex work. She's initially apprehensive about entering the business, and a group of young women teach her the ways of making a living. But Remy harbors ill intent. She's always a little bit off, as though something is bubbling just below the surface. What begins as a gritty, unapologetically perverse drama quickly erupts into a grisly slasher film. An unknown killer unceremoniously dispatches each sex worker in a gnarly fashion. The descent into madness is harrowing to say the least, and you won't forget the disturbing ending for as long as you live. Found footage is a tough sell, considering how oversaturated the genre is these days. But make it part mockumentary, and you have something that might entice those of us who would scoff otherwise. With horror in the high desert, Minerva. Filmmaker Dutch Marriage builds on his previous entry, 2021's Horror in the High Desert, by expanding the universe and digging his fingernails deeper into the macabre. Two separate stories about disappearances are pieced together into an unsettlingly grim picture. One young woman's body is discovered along a desolate stretch of highway, while another vanishes without a trace some distance away. Set in northeastern Nevada, the film possesses a true crime quality that makes what you see even more chilling. While it's a slow burn venture, the last 20 minutes make it all worth it. Brandon Cronenberg's Infinity Pool follows failing novelists James and his wife M as they go on vacation to a fictional seaside country. There, they befriend Gabby and her husband Alvin, a seemingly innocent tourist couple looking for a good time. However, when the resort's slimy underbelly reveals itself to be a sadosexual masochist's wet dream, Gabby unleashes unholy terror on James through a sick game of cat and mouse. In one of the resort's twist adventures, the rich pay to have their likeness cloned and then killed. Infinity Pool spares no expense in driving nails into the back of your skull. When it all hits the fan, Mia Goth dives even further into bonkers territory to deliver one of the year's most impressively peculiar performances. With his second feature film, Cronenberg demonstrates that he has a twisted mind just like his father David, but exhibits his own singular vision and aesthetic. Co-writers and co-directors Wesley Taylor and Alex Weiss strike a goldmine in horror and humor with Summoning Sylvia. Sure, the scares are slight, yet the cast's magnetism makes up for it. Following a group of gay men, the story unravels inside a Victorian-style home that the group rented for the weekend to celebrate Larry's upcoming nuptials. The fact the house is haunted is just icing on the cake. Decorated with spooky imagery and bumps in the night, Summoning Sylvia revs its engines when the group performs a seance to, well, summon Sylvia. Things go as planned, but Larry and his friends prove ill-prepared for what comes next. Larry's Kuwait veteran soon-to-be brother-in-law Harrison arrives, and his presence is far more horrifying than anything Sylvia has in store. Harrison's blatant bigotry drives the story forward, offering a timely reminder of how hate can sometimes be unlearned. Throughout the film, the group contends with both horrors of the literal and figurative variety. Arguably the third best entry in the franchise, Evil Dead Rise reapplies its own conventions in a new location. Set in a city high-rise, there's plenty of opportunity to elevate the tension, violence, and graphic set pieces. With a new cast of characters, Lee Cronin's installment competes with 2013's Evil Dead remake for the most blood used on screen, from the elevator sequence to the blood-doused finale. When Danny discovers the Necronomicon and a set of vinyl records, they unwittingly open up their family to be overtaken by the dead. Cronin twists the viewer through a gory funhouse, and some moments are so uncomfortable you can't help but squirm in your seat. Mom? Mommy's with the maggots now. Danny's Aunt Beth proves to be a worthy adversary against the dead and eventually picks up the iconic chainsaw to do a little slicing and dicing. With its endearing characters and buckets of blood, Evil Dead Rise demonstrates that a decades-old franchise can still be relevant to a new generation. Its admirable opening weekend debut of $24.5 million is more than enough evidence that the dead just won't stay dead. A TV set flickers in the blackness. A cartooned gentle hum fills the room. Two children, Kevin and Kaylee, find themselves locked in their home, where the doors and windows have all disappeared. Their father has also vanished. If that weren't terrifying enough, a voice emerges from the darkness and beacons the children to come upstairs. Drawing upon childhood fears, from darkness to being left alone, director Kyle Edward Ball utilizes wide shots, strange camera angles, and empty space to fill the audience with terror. It's what you don't see that's most horrifying. As the unseen entity 
circles closer, its demands grow more grotesque, such as put the knife in your eye. Despite scathing reviews from the general public, Skinamarink is one of the year's most ambitious and experimental releases. With its crackling cinematography, not unlike TV static, you get the sense the film is some long-lost relic from another time. As the camera pans to the very last moment, and something ungodly rises out of the darkness, the words, go to sleep, ring like a death knell. Good luck sleeping tonight. Robbie Banfitch is a found footage visionary. With the Outwaters, Banfitch wrangles genre tropes, flips them sideways, and slathers them in time-hopping distortion. The story follows a group of filmmakers heading out into the Mojave Desert to shoot a music video. Michelle is a folky singer-songwriter with high-rise artistic ambitions. With her friends, she hopes to make a visual worthy of her mother, as the song in question evokes her memories of her. Naturally, things go off the rails pretty quickly. Within the first day, eerie sounds boom in the distance, as though the sky is splitting in two. The following evening, a man with an axe is seen standing on the horizon, the night sky strewn above him. What ensues is bloody chaos. With Robbie wandering in the sweltering heat to safety as he uncovers something far grander than he could have predicted. We've already touched on Kyle Gallner's acting prowess once in this list, with Mother May I. When it comes to Carter Smith's The Passenger, Gallner delivers a menacing performance as Benson, a fast food worker who loses his marbles one day and takes his co worker Bradley for the right of his life. When Benson snaps, he goes on a violent murder spree around town, specifically targeting those who've done him or Bradley wrong. Things are intensely personal, and each kill feels visceral and raw. Beyond just being a gore fest, the movie brings up moral questions about revenge and holding on to the past. Call this one of the biggest surprises of 2023. Carter Smith is lucky enough to make this list twice, this time with Swallowed. Dom wants to send off his best friend Benjamin with a chunk of change before moving to LA, so he decides to participate in a drug deal. The cinch is he must swallow the little baggies of drugs and then retrieve them once they emerge from the other end. Dom didn't sign up for this, but he's held at gunpoint and has no other option. When Dom and Benjamin drive over the border to Canada, a redneck pays them a visit at a roadside rest stop. He punches Dom in the stomach, setting off a series of unfortunate events throughout the rest of the night. Turns out, the little baggies contain hallucinatory insects. From there, Smith turns it up to 11. The tension is so thick you could cut it with a knife. Eventually, Dom and Benjamin meet the granddaddy of the drug business, a man named Rich who possesses his own horrifying pleasures. Godless, the Eastfield exorcism is not your typical exorcism film, it's much more. There's a rawness to the story that grounds it in place, nailing the audience to the ground. With a script written by Alexander Anglis Wilson and directed by Nick Kozakis, the film relentlessly navigates religious extremism and blind faith. The story follows a cult that claims a young woman named Lara has been possessed by a demon and plots to exorcise the beast from her body. Lara's husband Ron believes it's for the best, but as things progress, he doubts whether the exorcist's intentions are as wholesome as he originally thought. Daniel James King possesses a braggadocious persona, believing himself to be the direct vessel of God. But his methods are brutal, evidenced as he puts Lara through literal hell. There's physical, emotional, and psychological torture, all in the name of the Lord. The movie also raises questions about mental health. Lara suffers from terribly frightening dreams, which leads her psychiatrist to believe she has paranoid schizophrenia. Rest assured, the film is not for the faint of heart. More than anything, it depicts what happens when religious extremism goes unchecked.